Okay, I guess uh, let's get started. Mm, this is working, right? Yeah. So um, I guess last time where we um, end, up, end up with was, um, so we talk about, you know, this view that, that you view the function class F um, in some sense as equivalent to uh, a set Q. Right, so if you have a function class f, and you can define this q to be the set of vectors of this form, or basically the output vector, which is a vector in R n, um, and here f is changing over the class f. Right, so in some sense, for the random random complexity perspective, these two objects are not very different. Right, so the random the empirical random complexity of f only depends on q. And also we have talked about the case when you have a finite Q of finite F. In some sense, in sometimes actually, even you have infinite F, you can have finite Q in some cases, but not very typical. Um, but in this case, uh, what you can show is that you can have a random marker complexity bound. Um, this is the so-called Massal lemma. So it's saying that um, if your Q satisfies that this is the, at the end of the last lecture. So suppose for every vector in Q, we have that this norm of the Q normalized by one over squared n is less than m, then we know that this quantity, which is essentially the rather marker complexity of F, is bounded by this two times m square times log of the size of q over n. So, um, and if you translate this back to the function class, then you know that if i satisfies that for every F in F, this F is bounded in average by M, right? This, this you can view this as an average size of F, but it's a quadratic mean, but not the later the mean. Uh, and then you have that the random marker complexity of this function class F is bounded by 2M square log of the size of F over it. So, and so in this time, we're gonna deal with the case where you don't have a finite hypothesis class, right? So if you have infinite hypothesis class, infinite Q or F, then what do you do? And what we're gonna do is that we're gonna uh, do a discretization, but now we're discretizing in the, in the Q space or the out space of F. So before, I think, you know, in one of the previous lectures, we discretized in the parameter space, and now we are going to discretize in this more fundamental space, the output space, because as we kind of argued that output space of the, is what's really fundamentally important, the parameterization is just the, something that influenced the output space, but if you have the same output space, but different parameterization, actually the functions class are not different. So, so the parameterization are not the most fundamental thing here. So, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna discretize the output space. And um, so, so, the, so and we still have this idea of epsilon, this concept of epsilon cover. So now we're gonna cover the output space, output space Q or the output space of F by this so-called epsilon cover. Let's recall the definition of epsilon cover. So recall that the definition was that C is epsilon cover of Q. Now I'm using, I'm talking about epsilon cover of Q, but I just changed the variable. I think before we call it epsilon cover of some other set. So with respect to some matrix, rho, if for any vector in Q, there exists a vector in C that covers it. And by covers it, it means that such that the distance between this vector is less than epsilon. 
And let me also define the so-called covering number, which is a quantity we're going to uh, use very frequently. So the covering number of So of, like there are several arguments. One thing is the, the target radius, the target um, radius epsilon, and also the, the set Q and the metric rho. This is defined to be the minimum size of epsilon cover of Q with respect to rho. Right, so this is the minimal possible size of the covering. Um, and, and so, sorry, there's a, so how, so, and in some sense you can use this covering number in actually two ways. One way is you talk about the covering of Q and the other way you can talk about the covering of F, right? So uh, even though I think the fundamental thing is about the Q. I think in the literature, you know, if you read the paper, then in most of cases, people talk about covering of the, you know, the function F, at least in, in many papers. So we're gonna use that language, but, uh, but they are essentially the same. So, so basically, um, let's first clarify. So if you do this for the covering of F, then it's the same thing. So if you have epsilon cover of the function class F, you just view F as a, as a function class. So then it's, it's saying that, it, you know, uh, satisfies that for every f in capital F, there exists f prime such that rho f f prime is less than epsilon. So it's just a, literally the same thing. Um, and also we're gonna choose the rho uh, to be the same, you know, for like it's like, a, like a for q and f. So basically what we're gonna do is that we're gonna choose rho uh, between Two vectors, right? In the Q in the Q perspective, you choose this to be one over square root n times uh, the L two distance. Recall that both v and v prime are dimension are in vector in space R n. So this is basically L. Sorry, I need, I need to, there's no square. So basically, this is a normalized version of the L two distance. The reason we normalize by one over square root n is just because this is more consistent. Um, you know, the normalization fundamentally doesn't matter, first of all, right? So whatever normalization you choose, it doesn't change the essence. And the reason why we choose a normalization here is just simply for uh, consistency with um, the, the function space view, where you have uh, two functions, then you define a row to be, suppose you have two functions, f and f prime, and what's the distance between them? Recall that, you know, we only restrict our function on the finite set of points, z1 up to zn, so the typical, definition of the distance would just be the L2 distance on the set of points. So it's just something like you look at the average difference between these two functions on zi's. And then you, you take the quadratic average and then you take the um, basically the quadratic average of the difference between f and f prime on set of zi's. And you can see that these are exactly the same row, um, just a View you can view them in the either the function space or you can view it in the uh, the vector space. And typically, people write this rho as rho to um, p n. So, so uh, the reason I guess you know for those who are not familiar with it, just to think of it, just arbitrary kind of like symbol to indicate this. But for those of you who are a little bit no uh, familiar with some of this function analysis, so I think the idea is that p n this is the empirical distribution. Basically uniform over Z1 up to Zn. And L2 of Pn means that you have an L2 metric defined on this empirical distribution, this uniform distribution on the, on the sphere. But if you don't know where this come from, like, no, no worry. This is just a, let, let's just treat it as an abstract, you know, like um, a symbol. Just because, you know, I'm gonna use this symbol several times just uh, for formality, um, but it really just means this. Um, okay, so 
So, and you know, with this view, basically, you know, as we as we have said, right? So you have a f, you know, corresponds to q, and a function f corresponds to this vector f z one up to f z n in q, and and it's a one to one correspondence. Also, the row corresponds to each other, so you can, in some sense, write this trivial kind of correspondence. If you look at the function space view with the metric row, then it's the carbon number is the same as you view it in the output. In the, in the output space, the vector space, and you use the metric normalized uh, L2 norm. And one of the reasons why we normalize by n by something that depends on n is just because you have n dimension. And n is something that's changing. So it's in some sense, it makes sense to normalize by that. Because if you have a chain vector with changing dimension, sometimes it's hard to compare different cases. So that's why you want to have a norm that doesn't depend on dimension. And from now on, we're going to write the, the function space view, like notation. We are going to write in the, 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 the F notation. Um, but in my mind, I'm always thinking about the output space because that's, that's just a vector space, which is much easier to think about. OK, so and also, I, I, you know, the, the formal kind of like a theorem will be stated in the function space. But, um, but when I prove it, I'm going to change to the Q just to make it more kind of explicit. And here's the theorem that kind of uh, deal with the, in some sense, this is a kind of like trivial discretization. What we're going to do is that we're going to first discuss this and then have a more advanced discretization, uh, which is called uh, chaining. So the trivial version is the following, which is in some sense, basically, um, um, basically the same as, uh, like in Siberia, the same as what we have done in, in lecture three. Um, but here we are doing the function space. So let F be a family of functions from some space Z to minus one, one. So I restrict that these functions to be bounded between minus one, one. And then for every epsilon larger than zero, you can show the following. So the rather marker complexity is less than epsilon plus, let me write it down and then interpret it, log of the carbon number with the radius epsilon over n. And we're going to show you know, uh, how to prove this. And when you show how to prove, when we prove it, you know, you'll see that this is in some sense the discretization error. And this is in some sense from the, the rather marked complexity of the of the the finite epsilon cover. So um, we'll see this more clearly in the proof. So in some sense, the, the general idea is that you approximate so the the proof, the general idea is that you approximate F by by an epsilon cover. And uh, maybe let's and then let's call it C and then maybe let's not give it a name. So by epsilon cover, and then when you have the epsilon cover, uh, for the epsilon cover, you have a random marker complexity bound, and then you pay something because of the discretization or the approximation. Okay, so, and when we prove it, as I said, you know, I tend to kind of change it to the vector space view just because then you don't need any of all, all of those kind of like function uh, on jargon about function space. So let's, um, let's, let's see be an epsilon cover of Q. Q is the output space, right? Q is the same thing, right? So then um, let's say this is has the size which is equal to the minimum covering number, right? Which is just the same as, as we claimed um, of the function class. So, and now, um, okay, so now if you look at the rather marker complexity of the function, as we claim that this is in some sense the same as the complexity of the output set, 
And now what you do is you say, I'm going to approximate V by the nearby point in the cover, right? So, so suppose you have this set Q and I have a vector V and I know that V is covered by something, right? You have an epsilon cover like this. You know that this point V is covered by, for example, this point V prime in, in, in the set C, right? Every, every point C, recall that every point C course, um, can cover a certain family of points, right? It can cover its neighbors in some radius. And, and, you, and you know that every point can be covered by some vector in C. So when the vector V can be covered by V prime, let's say, so then you know that V and V prime, the distance is less than epsilon. And then you can approximate, so for every V, find V prime in C, and you know that distance is less than epsilon. And also you can write V sigma in some sense just trivially as V prime sigma plus V minus V prime sigma, right? Maybe let's call this Z. So it's V prime sigma plus Z times sigma, right? And what you know is that Z is small. So because the distance, right? So you know Z and this distance, recall that we are using the scaled L2 norm. So this is less than epsilon. This is what we know. So then what we know that Z times sigma, you can use the, uh, I think this is one which, this is cauchy Schwartz, right? So the inner product of two vectors is less than the norm of the two vectors, the two norm of the two vectors. So this is less than square root n times epsilon times the norm of the sigma, which is n times epsilon, right? So, so basically we know that this error term is less than epsilon by doing this. And then, uh, so now we can go back to the Radomarker complexity You first use this uh, um, uh, so this is just the less than expectation using this uh, a few things right so less than epsilon right because z in the product with sigma is less than epsilon and this epsilon can be go outside of all of those things because epsilon is a constant so then you get plus epsilon. And here was the range of V prime. So V prime always has to be in C, right? There's no way that like, this is the, our definition of V prime. V prime is the, the cover in C. So then maybe let's say this, I guess this is equality, sorry. And then, uh, and then this one, you can use the Massal lemma. This is the complexity of the set C, the cover set C, this using Massal lemma you get square root to log C over N plus epsilon. Um, and, and we are done, right? C has this size. So this is just the square root to log N epsilon F L two P N over N plus epsilon. Okay, so pretty simple. Um, and any questions so far? Okay. So now let's talk about stronger theorem. And this is a, in my opinion, a pretty deep theorem because at least you know, a priori, I don't have much intuition about it, but you know, hopefully after you sh I show the proof, you know, it's, it's intuitive, but it's, it's something non-trivial. And this is generally this type of technique is called chaining. Uh, and there could be multiple ways to do this kind of chaining in situ different situations. So here, I'm, um, here the, the, the particular theorem is called Dudley theorem, Dudley, Dudley theorem. So the theorem is saying that, um, so, so let F be a family of functions. from Z to R. So here, actually I relax this even because this theorem is more general. It can work for even you know, functions that are not bounded. Uh, and so 
the Rademacher complex is bounded by the following. Let me write it down. It, it, it doesn't look very intuitive in the beginning, but I will explain. So it's an integral. So the, the variable is epsilon. So you are integrating a function of epsilon from zero to infinity. And you look at the covering number for different epsilon and you divide by uh, and the, so, it's the, so the integrand is square root of the log of the covering number over square root n. So at the first step, you know, it's not even clear whether this is a stronger theorem than before because, you know, um, it's not trivial to compare with the, the previous one. But actually, you can compare if you do some work. Um, so, so probably, you know, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show the proof um, and then I'm going to interpret this because, you know, I think from the proof, it's, it's pretty obvious that you are going to get a stronger statement. Uh, but if you just compare the form, you know, it's not that, you know, trivial to compare. But from the proof, you can see that this is like the proof technique is an extension of the previous proof technique. And you should kind of like, uh, it's pretty obvious that you should expect a stronger theorem. And then, you know, later I'm going to compare them and also interpret this because, you know, this form by itself is still somewhat kind of like hard to, hard to use, right? So how do we know whether I can integrate something good out of this, right? So, so, so I'm going to you know, give you certain several cases where you can integrate a good number out of this integration. So that's the plan. Um, all right, so, so now let's dive into the proof. Like a, so how do we prove this and what's the intuition? So let's start with the intuition. The intuition is that um, this is actually probably one of the pretty technical proof um, in, in, this, in this course. So, um, so intuition is that you have this, um, I guess I'm, I'm thinking about whether I should draw a single figure. I, I've, I've, I've drawn a lot of figures on, the, on my lecture notes but I think it's gonna be challenging for the scrap note takers to produce all of them in the notes. So I'm thinking if I should draw one. Yeah, maybe I'll draw multiple and uh, let the scrap note takers to figure out how to merge them if they want. Um, so the, the intuition is, let me draw this again. So, so you have this set Q and what we have done was that you create a cover, an epsilon cover. Right, it covers this and every center is one point in C and you want all of these you know, balls to cover your set, right? So, and what you, we have done was that you have a vector V here and, and you say that I'm going to approximate V by V prime and plus the distance. So basically you approximate V by V prime plus the, dis, the difference Z. So, um, so this is all fine. The problem is that, you know, how do you, so you have this formula, which, let me just write again. So the tricky thing is that how do you deal with the, this error, z times sigma, right? So what we did before was that we have a very brute force inequality saying that this is less than two norm of z times two norm of sigma over. And when this can happen, this can happen only if z is perfectly correlated with sigma which just cannot happen always, right? Because Z is a vector, which is a difference between V and V prime. This, it could be correlated with sigma, you know, you know, if your ball is, you know, if it, so by the way, this ball is like, a, you know, I draw it as a, like a ball, but this is, this could be of a different shape, right? Because if every, all the, everything is a really a ball, right? So suppose this is really just a Euclidean ball then everything will become too trivial for us, right? So Q is a set and, there is a, some metric defined on it. And this metric is potentially somewhat complicated, which we don't really know. The metric is, uh, sorry, the, like a, the, the, sorry the, the metric is trivial, but the, the set itself is, could be complicated because you don't really know what a set looks like, right? It's the image of a function on some uh, set of vectors, on set of points, right? So, so this, this set is, uh, these are all balls, but the, the, the set itself is, could be uh, somewhat kind of like weirdly shaped. So that's why this Z may not always be correlated with Sigma. So in the worst case it can, but you know, not, not always possible. So, 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 the, so basically the question is that, you know, 
can we strengthen this inequality here? Like why this has to be worst case? So, so if you think about this, right? So um, what is the, if you think about it, so uh, what is the soup expectation of the, so basically what you really care about, what you care about is the following. So you can take this, So let me just write down, let me do a little bit slowly so that, uh, um, so you, you care, so you do this inequality, you first uh, say that this is less than the expectation of the soup of the first term plus the expectation of the soup of the second term. This is because, you know, um, I guess we have claimed that, you know, uh, expectation of soup a plus B is always less than uh, expectation of soup of A plus expectation of soup of B. All right, so, so, so the first thing you can do is this following, and then you care about this. And before, as I said, you know, we, we have a very worst case inequality for the inner product, but actually this, is, this point itself, you know, may not be that worst case, right? Because here Z is in this, in some sense in this, ball around V prime, right? So you have this ball V prime here, which is the, which is a ball and the Z is, is in this ball. So, so if this, this ball is not like a, you know, in some sense this Z is in the, and you can create this, you, know, you can make this, uh, this cover, you know, of a certain shape so that this, in this ball, in some sense, this is the ball intersect with Q. If it's really a ball, I think you, um, uh, the, the, the worst case inequality is tight, but actually you are intersecting this ball with the Q and Q could be weirdly shaped. So, so if you look at this, then this one could still be possibly small because you know, if this, uh, this, this ball intersect, intersected with Q is of a small complexity, right? So, 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 what you, so basically the idea is that what you do is that the, for the first thing, you just do the, the log of the covering number, but for the second thing, you do another round of like discretization. So because you don't want to say that Z can be worst case, I, I want to say that Z probably cannot be worst case. Z has to be, have some structure. So I'm going to discretize it, it again. Sorry, I, I mean, how do I turn this off? Okay. Um, wait, why am, why am I having this? Sorry, my bad. I'm not using it, I guess, right? So everyone is, so like the, everyone on Zoom meeting can hear me, right? Could, could hear me, right? So, sorry, I forgot to take off the headphone, my bad. Can you still hear me? Okay, I hope you can hear me. Okay, thank you, thanks. Okay, cool. Sorry, my bad. I forgot to um, take off it. Okay, so so basically the kind of idea is that you, this is still a rather macro complexity of V V prime in a set with Q, and and you can do another round of discretization for this set so that you get you know even a tighter inequality. So that's kind of the the, the rough idea. So basically you have a nested um, la la layers of like uh, discretization to make to make it stronger and stronger. So, so that's the basic idea. And now let's do a let's make it a little more formal so that I can um, define something and, and, uh, and, and explain the intuition more. So let's say we have, so, so I guess, you know, maybe just to, to briefly draw this, you know, a little bit, so, so what you do is you do another discretization of this yellow ball. And then you say that this Z cannot be worst case. It has to be something like Z can be approximated by this plus this. I'm not sure whether this is too, I, I will draw a bigger figure, figure but basically this, this point Z is now, you approximate Z by its nearest neighbor again, and then you look at a difference. And then you approximate difference by something else. I, I will draw this more formally uh, in a moment. So, 
Um, to do that, let's define epsilon zero to be as the soup uh, over f soup over i x max over i f z i. So this is just the, the maximum possible value that you can output. And, and you can see that this is just some preparation, which is almost trivial. So you can see that this is always bigger than this because each entry epsilon is bigger than each of the FZIs. And this is equals to square root of one over n, the two norm v square for every v in q. So, so basically epsilon zero is an upper bound of the entire set. You have to not have to talk about any epsilon bigger than this because you know everything is in this ball uh, of epsilon zero. And now I'm going to create this nested uh, uh, or this. Uh, technically, it's not nested, but I think I've always thought about it as, as a nested family of like uh, discretizations. But technically, you don't really need a nested part. So let me draw this. You know. Uh, okay, let me define things first. So, for, so I'm going to consider epsilon one to be half times epsilon zero. Epsilon two is a quarter of epsilon zero. So in general, epsilon j is two to the minus j epsilon zero. So, so these are um, the kind of like the the radius for my epsilon cover, and let c j be uh, and epsilon j cover of the set Q of Q. So I have this family of, of epsilon covers. Uh, and intuitively, you can think of, kind of think of epsilon j plus one cover, like cj is nested in c, cj plus one is nested. In CJ, in some sense, but I don't. But this is not necessary for the proof, and also it's not entire, you know, but not necessary. I just like to think like that, just uh, to give me some kind of like, uh, um, kind of intuition. So, so what's really happening? Let me draw. If I draw this, what's really happening is that I have this set Q. Maybe I shouldn't draw a ball, so that it's kind of like more interesting. So this is the set Q, and, um. There is a there is a biggest thing which is the epsilon zero which co covers everything. Let me not draw that. So if you use the epsilon zero cover, then it's trivial because epsilon zero you can just use a trivial cover to cover. You just need one point to cover everything. So you, you just need the origin. Let's not draw that. Let's draw uh, something maybe epsilon one. So what happens is that you use you have a very coarse grain cover at the beginning, something like this. Right, so, so this is your epsilon one. Um, and, and I have a point, this is something really hard to draw, so I need to follow my notes exactly so that I don't have any issues with it. So I guess suppose I have a point, let's say here, this is my point V that I want to approximate by the cover. So suppose this is the origin. So before what I do is that, maybe let's draw this V somewhere else, sorry. Maybe let's draw V here. So, so this is, let's call this U1. This is the closest point in the first level of the epsilon cover. So, so before I just use U1 to approximate V. And now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to first use U1 and then I consider the second level of the epsilon cover. So which is of a smaller size, you know, which is of the actual size half. So whether this is, by the way, this, this number two is not nothing magical. You can make it something like three or four. It's just uh, for convenience. You just need a constant, um, constant factor smaller um, net, you know, at every level. So, so you have this, for example, right? So this is the second level. And what you do is you say, I'm going to take the point U2 here, 
u2 is the nearest neighbor of v in the second level. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to approximate v by u1 plus this vector between u2 and u1. So, so then I have a smaller distance between v and u2, right? So, and then I'm going to have the third level. Maybe I'll only draw three levels. So that suppose in the third level, what happens is that you have uh, another thing here, and this is u3. And then you also consider this vector between u2 and u3. So basically you approximate v by this red vector plus the green vector plus the yellow vector. And then you continue to do this until you get to v. So any questions so far? So basically I'm going to approximate v by u1 plus u2 minus u1 plus u3 minus u2 until infinity, because I'm going to have like an infinite number of these coverings. Um, I mean, it doesn't have to be exactly infinite number of them. If you have fine grain enough, like a approximation you can stop, but for simplicity, let's just say we have an infinite sequence of epsilon covers and you can uh, do this. So, so more formally, what I'm going to do is that for every V in Q, like a, let's, I guess this is just a, a formal de definition. So it's, it's nearest neighbor, nearest neighbor in CJ, right? So, so that's why by definition, because UJ has to be covered by CJ, so that's why, so V has to be covered by CJ, so that's why V time, the distance between V and UJ is less than epsilon J, um, right? So or in other words, one over squared in times V CUJ2 norm is less than epsilon J. And, and also you, because epsilon J goes to zero, we know that UJ goes to V eventually as J goes to infinity, as J goes to infinity. So that's why you can write this nested sum. You can write this as u1 plus u2 minus u1 plus u3 minus u2, so and so forth, right? And if you let u0 to be zero, then you can write this as u1 minus u0 plus u2 minus u1. This is just a, to make it look nicer so that we can write it as sum. So this is sum of u i minus u i minus one, from i from one to infinity. And you can check the convergence here if you really want, right? So just uh, because I have this, so, so if you look at the partial sum, then is um minus u zero. And because u m is partial sum, this goes to, V as M goes to infinity. So, so this could convert. And technically you actually, if you really want to have a proof and you don't have to actually have to use, uh, use the infinite sum. I, I'm just uh, trying to make it simpler. So you can just uh, say, I'm gonna choose the M that is big enough. And then I, I pay some small error at the end. That's also fine. Um, so, okay. So, and once we do this and what, as we kind of planned, so we have this kind of like a, better and better approximation, right? So now let's deal with each of these factors. So what we have is that the expectation of the soup, this becomes expectation times sum of ui minus ui minus one sigma, and from one to infinity, right? So, and then you um, switch the sum with the soup so you get expectation less than expectation soup. Uh, maybe let's take some say soup. Right. And and then this is equals to sum the expectation of the soup.
Okay, so and and here the constraint is that ui needs to be in ci and ui minus one needs to be in ci minus one. Right. So so in some sense, this quantity, each of this quantity, is kind of like some kind of like random marker complexity. But the, but this is a finite class because ui and ui minus one now are not arbitrary vectors. They have to come from a finite set. And then we just have to deal with, you know, we just have to see what's the right marker complexity of this set uh, and, and then continue with the derivation. So, um, okay, so let's try to deal with each of these terms. So, so um, we're trying to use Masal Lemma, right? So Masal Lemma is dealing with, is trying to deal with these kind of terms uh, for finite set. So first of all, CI, so, so the combination of U, UI and UI minus one are the variables, right? So they are in CI times CI minus one and CI times CI minus one. The size is equals to this, the size of CI times CI minus one. So this is something you, you, you can compute and simplify that in a moment. Uh, and you can also have, and for, by the way, for the Masai Lama, let's just go back real quick. So I think we had this in the beginning. So for Masai Lama, you have to check how large, you have to check how large the vectors are, right? So, so this M doesn't matter, right? If all the vectors are super big, then your complexity will be big. And if all the vectors are extremely small, then your complexity will be small. So, so let's check what's the value of M here. So the value M is the bound on the two norm of the vectors, the normalized two norm of the vectors, right? So, so basically we need to check one over square root n times ui minus ui minus two, two norm, how large this can be eventually. So, uh, so this can be, if you upper bound this, this is at most, you just do a trivial triangle inequality and wait, sorry, I could, my bad, my bad. You cannot do a triangle inequality. That, that would defeat the purpose. So what I'm gonna do is that, uh, yeah, sorry. So you, you are gonna do a slightly more careful triangle inequality because you want to say UI and UI minus one are close, right? So, so but UI and UI minus one themselves, each of them could be big if you look at this, right? So U1 and U2, you know, as, as vectors, they are, they, are, they are probably big, but their differences is small. And smaller and smaller as you have bigger and bigger eyes. And how do you control that? I think there's actually an easy way. You just write this as ui minus v because you can always compare with v. That's something you know, right? So, and then you use triangle inequality because both ui minus v is somewhat small and ui minus one v is somewhat small. And how small they are, so you know that the first term, square root, one over square root times ui minus v, this is less than epsilon i. And, and the first term and the second term is less than epsilon i minus one. This is just by the definition of the, uh, of the epsilon cover, right? So, and epsilon i is two to the minus i times epsilon zero. So epsilon i is smaller than epsilon i minus one. So by, by a factor of two, so, so this is actually three times epsilon i, just because epsilon i minus one is two times bigger than epsilon i. Okay, so with all of this preparation, we can apply the Masai lemma. Then, what you have is that this soup is less than. So we get square root two times the m square. This this is the m, right? So you have m square, which is three epsilon i square, and then times the log of the covering number, and the, the covering number, sorry, the log of the size of the of the set. The size of the set is ci times ci minus one, and over over n. Right. So, and let's try to simplify this a little bit. So you get three epsilon i outside over square root n and you have square root log ci plus log ci minus one and, and times two. And then you say that this is less than, so, C, so ci 
is probably bigger than it's always bigger than CMS one because you know CI is a more fine grained epsilon cover discretization than CMS one. So if you have more fine grain, you should have more sets, more points. This is just by definition. So uh, so you get you just bound CMS one by CI, so you get six epsilon i over square root n times square root log ci because we just replaced this term by log ci okay so the constant doesn't really matter that much uh, anyways so uh all right so so now let's see what we have achieved right so we have bound each of these term and let's go back to this formula so we just plug it in so what we got is that uh so we got expectation sup 1 over n v sigma, this is our target, which is less than the sum of this over i, i from one to infinity, six epsilon i over square root n square root log ci. So this is still not really an integration, right? So, um, um, so how do you turn this into integration, right? But this is kind of like has a little bit of flavor of integration. You have like, a, you know, a lot of terms, right? In some sense. Um, so, so how do we see this, right? So there, there. I think the the way I see this is the following. So, um, so what's the? Maybe let me just write down what's the final formula you want to achieve. The final formula you want to achieve is to recall that this is something like twelve times one over square root n times square root log n epsilon f l two p n the epsilon. Right. This is the final formula we want to achieve. And by the way, in some sense, actually, you don't really have to get this integration if you if you don't if you just care about you know, applying this to some cases because this is enough for you to apply it. Uh, it's just like a, this integration looks so nice and, and it's kind of like a it's a it's a good interface, you know, in in a mathematical sense. But then, so so how do you see these two are almost the same? Um, the way I see it is the following. So if you think about what this integration is, right? So they have epsilon on this. Uh, on this dimension, and let, let's plot the the cover number. The cover number will be the log. This is the log cover number. Log uh, maybe let's say square root log, square root log and epsilon f l two p n. So you plot this, and at some point, this this cover number will be one. And so the log of the cover number will be zero. This is just because when you when your radius is big enough, you can just use one thing to cover everything. So the log cover number can be one, right? It, and particularly in our notation, when, when your radius is epsilon zero, then your cover number becomes one and the log cover number becomes zero. So square root of that is also zero. So, and, and this, this cover number will, be go to, will go to infinity eventually as epsilon goes to zero because um, you, know, you need more and more points in covers as you have like a more and more fun grain covers. So, and, and you have this you know, sequence of like points, but so like a, you have, for example, epsilon one is here, right? So which is half of epsilon zero, um, but let's look at epsilon i. So let me try to draw this exactly as my notes. So suppose this is epsilon i, and, and if this is epsilon i, then a half of it will be epsilon i plus one by definition. So this is epsilon i plus one. And, and what, what is this value? This is value the corresponding cover number, right? So this is square root log ci, right? That's, the, that's our, in our notation, right? So, and, and now let's, let's compare these two quantities, right? This, this quantity and this quantity. This is what we are trying to link. Right, so the quantity below is just the, the the error under curve under this curve, right? That's the definition of. The, okay, I guess I'm ignoring the one over square root n, which is, you know, e easy, right? So so if you don't have the one over square root n or the twelve, right? The, the so so this integral is just the the error under curve, and now what's this final sum? And if you look at the final sum, then this epsilon, like uh, if you look at the this thing, the area of this triangle, uh, sorry, this is not a triangle, this is a rectangle, my bad. <laughs> so the area of this rectangle, then is uh, the, the, the area, the mass of the 
uh, is this is epsilon i minus epsilon i plus one oh, times the height, which is square root log ci. And epsilon i and epsilon i plus one are just the, this is just the, let me see what's the best. I think this is epsilon i over two times log of ci. And this is just the multiple of this term. Right, so, so basically the final sum is in some sense just dealing with the, all of these rectangles and the integral is doing all everything. So, so that's why the, the sum of the rectangles will be smaller than the integrals up to a constant factor. So basically what you know is that you know epsilon i over two square root log ci because this is the, this area is less than the integral uh, of this part, right? If this is less than the integral of this part. It's less than integral from epsilon i plus one to epsilon i and square root log and epsilon uh, two p n the epsilon. Okay, so and with this we we can just take sum over all i's. So you you so you have sum of epsilon i over two square root log c i is less than sum over i from one to infinity infinity. Uh, sorry, this is not uh, right. So, and and now you can see that this, you know, each of these integral has the matching upper bound, lower bound. So you get, this is from zero to epsilon zero, square root log n epsilon to pn, the epsilon. And the upper bound is still not infinity, but that doesn't really matter because this really literally just equals to infinity. You can extend it to infinity because everything beyond epsilon zero, bigger than epsilon zero, will be zero. So, so that's what we have. Okay, so now you just, if you just multiply, this, this is the essential thing, right? So using the, with this inequality, you just link these two quantities, you know. So I think you just have to work out the, Constant, I think there's a constant two there. So that's why you get from six to 12. So with this, you get expectation. And this is actually the rather marker complexity of F is equals to this. It's less than it's Leo F six epsilon I over square root N square root log CI. And this is less than 12 times this integral. The epsilon. Okay, so any questions? Okay, great. So okay, so and 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 I think from this figure you can also kind of see that you know in some sense the essence here is that how fast epsilon goes to infinity. That's what's important here, right? Because if epsilon goes to infinity very fast, then your integration probably could be even infinity. So then you don't have any bound. And if, you're, uh, if this thing goes to infinity, like here, slower, then you'll get a better bound. Yeah, so the question is like, oh, I chose this uh, level like by a factor of two, right? So like it's two to the minus J times epsilon zero. So what if I change that two to three or something like that? I, I never tried that myself, but I think um, very, very likely you would just get a similar constant. Maybe you get better than 12, maybe you get a worse than 12, but anyway, this constant is not that important for us. So, but I, I, I think it's very unlikely you can gain anything by like you can get, gain anything more than a constant. Yeah. Okay, so now let's, let's try to interpret this theorem a little bit more because in some sense, this theorem, you know, at this form is kind of hard to use, right? So because, you know, if I got the log covering number bound, 
And okay, what's the in intent use of this theorem? So the, the way to use this theorem is that you, you, you get some log covering number bound, and then you do this integral, you get the random marker complex, right? So, but, uh, but it's kind of like hard to use it because you know, before you get the, so you, you don't know how, how does this translation work you know, explicitly. But actually the translation from the covering number to the random complex actually, it's actually relatively simple as, as, as I will show. So this integration doesn't have, like, like you, you will see like, a, actually you, you don't even need to, like, like, like I never compute this integral myself like after I done it once in some sense. Like, uh, so here's how it works. So, so for the, um, so, yeah, so basically the question is when this is finite, right? So when this is this thing is finite. And and when it's finite, you know, what's the dependency, right? So on and so forth. So when it's finite. So I think there are several cases. Like let's do a kind of this is a case study. So it, of course it depends on what the law covering number will be. So we have I have a few cases here. So A, if the covering number is exponential in epsilon is of the form m is of the form something like one over epsilon to the power some power r. R is just a variable like a placeholder. So suppose it's exponential in epsilon in the sense that one over epsilon is in the base. Then you can do this computation, you get And this is equals to something like on one over square root n square root r log one over epsilon. Right. So this because you take a log cover number. And and you will see that, and you take the, the epsilon. And you will see that the log one over epsilon integrate to some constant uh, from zero to infinity. Oh, by the way, I think maybe I should say. I, I forgot to take a, yes. Uh, there's a small thing, like I don't want to always integrate from zero to infinity because that sometimes is actually annoying. So yeah, I forgot to mention this. So let's assume the the alpha is bounded between let's say minus one, one, so that this integral only have to do, you only have to do it in between zero and infinity. So like epsilon zero, let's say is one, something like this, or maybe a constant. So we only have to, to integrate between zero to, to one, let's say. All right, so, so this is just because you have a bounded function after that, like the log covering number because it becomes zero. And now let's integrate, okay, going back to this, we integrate between zero and one, this log one over epsilon. And you see that, you know, this log one over epsilon actually integrates to something of, of strictly a constant. So this will be um, just the O, maybe let's write, okay, in one notation, I should write this like, I think this is just a, on the order of like square root R over N because the epsilon integrates to a constant. The dependency on epsilon is gone. Okay, so, so so that's good. So you get this thing and let's look at another case. So this is actually a case where the dependence on epsilon is very, very mild because it's log one of epsilon. So that's why it's pretty mild. And, but sometimes you never get, you don't get this. So, so if it's an epsilon F L2 PN is of the form a to the epsilon r over epsilon. So now the epsilon is in exponent, um, um, but um, yeah, and, and, this, and, and it's one over epsilon in the exponent. And in this case, if you look at this more of a square root n integral log covering number, this will be well, square root n r over epsilon, square root r over epsilon log a. Right. So, and this is still, so 
the epsilon and, and still square root one over epsilon this integrates to one. The epsilon, this is a constant. A universal constant you can, I guess we don't care about constant, so, so it's some constant. Um, and this is equals to, so basically, if you ignore the log factor, this is equals to over n. So still of this form. That's still good. And now it, it comes to the, the tricky thing, which is kind of like it's on a kind of on the boundary between what we can do and what we cannot do. So if this is of the form something like a to the r over epsilon square, so now I have a even worse dependency on epsilon, right? So it's an exponent and also it's one over epsilon square. So it goes to infinity as epsilon goes to zero faster. So, and in this case, this becomes a little bit tricky because, and but actually this is the most common case, right? If you, if you really do the work, you know, I don't really expect you to prove any generalization on yourself, um, um, you know, that, that often, right? like, uh, but if you really do the work in many of the cases, you get this kind of like cover number. So, and this is actually tricky because if you integrate, uh, the thing, what you get is that uh, uh, you take the log of this and you take square root. So what you get is maybe let's so you get square root r times one over epsilon uh, times square root log a. Right. So this is the epsilon. So this is square root r, square root log a, square root n, one over epsilon d, d epsilon. And this, this thing is actually infinity. Um, I guess this is because the, how do you see this? Like a one over epsilon integrates to log epsilon and then log epsilon at zero is infinity. So this goes to infinity too fast at zero so that it integrates to infinity. So, so this is actually, you know, this is not good news for us, right? So, so how do we, but actually this can be fixed. Uh, how do we fix this? So this can be fixed by our improved version. Of the theorem. And this improved version in some sense, you know, I'm not gonna prove it, but it actually is kind of like almost expected. So what you can show is that, so basically, the idea is that you don't do, do the discretization all the way to zero. You do it until a certain level so that you can pay the, the worst case bound. So basically you, you, you do it only to the level of alpha. So you bind it by this. I think there's a, actually I'm not sure whether there's a two here, but let me have the two here anyway. So that for safety. Anyway, the constant is not very important. So basically when you do the integration, you are not integrating from zero to infinity, you are integrating from alpha to infinity. And below alpha, you just pay this alpha bound. So in some sense, you can see that this is the interpolation of the two bounds we had, right? So recall that one bound we had was this brute force brute forcing where we pay this epsilon, like, right? So this is just because we have a worst case bound for the, for the epsilon error. And in the other case, we had this integration. We don't pay anything in the worst case. And this is basically saying that you do this nested or iterative discretization into alpha, and then you pay a small error alpha at the end. Um, and, and why this is useful? This is useful because you know, it kind of like avoids this tricky regime where you are very, very close to zero. So what you can do is that like uh, I think this theorem, you, you, you can probably prove it yourself. So I, I'm, I'm not going to show the proof. Um, so, and if you use it, so you can take alpha to be something like one over poly, poly n. So something super, super small, right? So, and so that is four alpha, so that four alpha is negligible. And, and so that you hear on the right-hand side, you, you don't integrate to infinity. So, so basically four alpha is negligible. And the question is what integration, uh, or the integration look like. So this is something like inverse poly n, which is negligible. And then you have square root r, square root log a, 
square root n and you integrate between alpha and one and you have one over alpha, one over epsilon d epsilon. And unfortunately this one, even though it goes to infinity as alpha epsilon goes to zero, like a, as alpha goes to zero, but this is actually something that depends on alpha very, very weakly. So, so this is this, right? I'm not sure why this is not. I, I, you know what my notation means, right? Like, sometimes I think in different uh, calculus book, I see different notations for this. So, so sometimes I got confused. So, and now this thing is really just a, times uh, this is like a log one, which is zero and minus log alpha. So you get log one over alpha. And this is logarithmic in alpha. So it's, and alpha is poly n, so this is logarithmic in n. So this is log n. So, so basically eventually this is still O tilde square root R over square root n, if you hide all the logarithmic factor. Okay, so in summary, so, so the covering number of the form one over epsilon to the r, a to the r over epsilon, a to the r over epsilon square, all lead to some all leads to something like a random marker complexity bound of this form. And these are probably basically the pretty much the only cases I, I, I know of that can lead to this. Like for example, if you suppose hypothetically your current number is something like a to the alpha r r over epsilon cube, I think this will uh, will break um, because so so here if this is epsilon cube, and I think here it's going to be epsilon to the one point five one over epsilon to one point five. And when it's up, so maybe let's do a, a quick and heuristic. So suppose this epsilon to the 1.5. And of course you still have to integrate from alpha so that you don't, you, avo you try to avoid the blow up, right? So, but it wouldn't be as effective because one of epsilon to the 1.5, this, the integration of this is, I think one over square root epsilon instead of log epsilon. And I think this will be, um, one minus one over square root alpha. Wait, I think it did that. Yeah. Okay, there's a minus here, I think, right? So so, so it's gonna be something like one over square root alpha. Minus one, something like this. Maybe there's a half here. It, 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 yeah. Anyway, let, let's let, let's ignore the constant. I, I don't know what the constant is, but but the problem is that this is not log alpha, this is one over square root alpha. So and now you cannot take alpha to be poly, inverse poly n because if it's inverse poly n, you, you pay too much here. So uh, and so so then it's gonna it's gonna be a very tricky balance between this four alpha term and, and this term. Right. And I think at least I'm not aware of any cases where you can balance them in a nice way so that you get still a good bound. Um, I think it's gonna be probably not even possible. Um, and but on the other hand, you know, for the case when you have this thing, right, this is log one over alpha here. So the balance is tri trivial. It's kind of like your free lunch if you pay a log factor. So, so it's, it's almost always possible, right? So, so that's, the, uh, that's the difference. Um, right, and, and, and actually most typically you're gonna get some cover number of this form. That's, that's the most typical cases. Okay, any questions? Okay, so now I have 15 minutes today. So, um, so the, the rough plan for the, for the next, uh, the rest of the 15 minutes and the next lecture is that we are gonna talk about covering number bound for linear models and deep nets. And those will imply rather marker complexity bounds. And I think Today I'm gonna to talk about linear models, but for linear models, I'm not gonna give you the proof because I think the proof is a little bit too technical. Um, in most of the cases, you wouldn't you need to use prove it yourself. You just have to invoke it. So basically I'm just gonna, um, 
I'm going to just uh, state some theorems and tell you that actually for linear models, this is almost, almost a kind of, well, I think it's kind of almost uh, all done. Like you, you know everything about it. And uh, I think they are pretty much like a matching upper bound, lower bound. Um, so this is actually from a paper by Tong Zhang in 2012, sorry, 2002. 2002. So, um, so he's saying that this is for, li for linear models. So linear models. So yeah, so, so suppose there are x1 up to xn in Rd are n data points. And P and Q is this so-called conjugate pairs. I guess, I hope that probably you have seen this kind of thing, seeing how the inequalities, if one, one over P plus one over Q is equals to one. And also we also assume that P is larger than two and less than infinity. But in most of cases, you just can think of P and Q are both two. That's the most important thing. And assume that the P norm of X is less than C for every I. And then let's consider this hypothesis class F indexed by Q. So this is the family of linear models where the norm of the linear model is bounded by B, right? Recall that we have actually talked about this kind of models right? where P is two and Q is two, or maybe P is one and Q is infinity, this kind of things. So, and then before we, we prove the Radomar complexity bound, and now we prove the, the covering number bound, which will also give a Radomar complexity bound. And, and this rho is equals to L2PN, L2PN, this is the same thing as we have defined before. And then the law covering number epsilon FQ, sorry, FQ times rho is less than B square C square over epsilon square. Sailing, the sailing doesn't matter, it's just a trying to deal with the corner cases where this is like zero or something like that. So L2 log two, two D plus one. So, and when P, so, and when P is two, Q is two, you can strengthen this, can strengthen this. Slightly. to something like log an epsilon F2 rho is less than B squared C squared over epsilon squared times the log two. I guess the, the base is also doesn't important because it's only changed the constant. It's just that I copy it from, the, the base of the log doesn't really matter that much. I'm, I'm probably in here just uh, for the sake of preciseness. So you can you can improve the D dependency to something that depends on N or D, which doesn't matter that much, um, uh, at least for our purpose. You know, for for the for other cases, you, if you you care about the bond that absolutely doesn't depend on D, then this is ma this matters. Otherwise, it doesn't matter that much. Okay. So so and and the way to remember this is just that this gives the same random market complexity right so basically if you um, use the discussion of above use the the conversion above right we have done so this is of the form which form this is of the form this thing right a to the r over epsilon square right because here you have a log right like after taking a log is r over epsilon square and R is B square C square. So, so using this conversion, you get that the rather marker complexity is less than square root R over N and where R is B square C square. So this is B C over square root N um, up to logarithmic factor. And this was very similar to, this is 
the same thing as we have them before, right? So B was the norm of the classifier and C was the norm of the, uh, the data. So you get the multiplication of them and the overscore too. So there's some small differences in terms of the logarithmic factor. So which let's ignore just for simplicity. Okay, and you can also do, you can also show this for multi-linear models. Uh, ma sorry, multivariate, multivariate linear functions. And I'm showing this just because this will be useful as a building block, as building block for the future. Because uh, when you have like a when you have new networks, you know, a linear, a multivariate linear model is a building block for a network, a layer of network. Um, and this, in some sense, there's nothing really intelligent here, is, is, but I just have to state it so that I can use it later. So, so suppose you have, okay, so first let's have a def small definition. So definition, so suppose M is a matrix of this form, is an M by N matrix. Let's define the two norm, two to two comma one norm. This is not the operator norm. This is the just the some some arbitrary norm. So this is the two comma one norm, which is the sum of the two norm of the columns. Uh, yeah. So M i is of dimension M. And and you take the so basically you first take the two norm of the column and then you take the one norm to to group them. Right. So and and then you know using this definition, I'm transposed to one norm. This is basically the sum of the two norms of rows of n. So it's just definition, and then we're going to use this in the statement. So here is a lab a theorem. The theorem is that if you consider here, I'm not going to do a P and Q just for simplicity. So you just do the two norm version. So P and Q are both two. So you consider the multivariate uh, uh, function with output, multi multiple outputs, um, and this W, let's say, is of dimension M by D, and let's constrain the W, the two to one norm of W to be less than D. So, and again, let's C to be the average of the norm of the data. And then you get log n epsilon f l2 pn is less than c square b square over epsilon square log log 2d times m. So, so it's kind of the same thing, the norm of the parameter times the norm of the data over epsilon square. Um, but the norm of the parameter is measured by this two to one norm, oh sorry, two to the norm of W transpose. I think I think I have a typo here. So what's the two to one norm of W transpose? As I said, is the sum of the two norms of the rows of W. Um, so, so in some sense, there is nothing surprising here. In some sense, you just uh, glue all the dimensions, like you just treat all dimensions independently in some sense. Like, uh, like for example, if you think about, suppose you write W, let's be a different color. Suppose you write W as W1 transpose up to WM transpose, where you have M uh, vectors, row vectors, and then WX is really just uh, you multiply W1 transpose with X up to WM transpose X. So you can view this, you know, linear layer as you know m different linear functions, one-dimensional linear functions, and then the two to one norm of this just the sum of the wi two norm. So in some sense, you just sum, you take the sum of the complex dimension. 
sum of complexity measure of each of the model wi transpose x. All right, so wi two norm is the complex measure of the linear function, and you take the sum. So the proof is actually just a, yeah, there's nothing more there. Um, I think I have five minutes. Let me also mention another thing which is useful for our preparation for the deep nets. So this is also related to how do you do how do we deal with thing, bounding the log covering num the covering number. So you can also have the Lipschitz composition. This is a useful tool for us to do deal with the covering number. And this is actually re recall that you know we had this telegram lemma, right? So we had the telegram lemma which was like for the Rademacher complexity, right? So you say something like the Rademacher complex of phi composed with H is less than some Lipschitzness of phi times the Rademacher complexity of H, something like this. So this, this was the Lipschitz composition for Rademacher complexity. And it turns out that for log covering number, the Lipschitz composition is even trivial. This, the telegram lemma, I didn't prove it for you. I just say, this is a fact, this is a theorem. And actually proving it doesn't, then it's not easy, like as I mentioned. Like it's, it's actually sometimes pretty complicated. It's pretty, it's, I think it's a challenging theorem to prove. Um, and here the Lipschitz composition becomes trivial for covering number. Um, um, I think this, the, the fundamental intuition of the spirit is the same. It's just for covering number somehow this becomes super intuitive and explicit. Like, uh, so the, let me state the lemma, but uh, yeah, I think I have time. So this is almost a trivial thing. So suppose phi is kappa Lipschitz. And then and let's say rho is this L2 norm thing, like then the log cover number of phi epsilon phi composed with F. Like I, I messed up my order of these arguments like in my notes, like for every occurrence this after a certain point. So that's why I have to fix it later. So um, so epsilon, so if you look at the log carbon number of the composed function class phi composed with F, this is less than the log carbon number of, of the original one, but you have a different radius or different um, granularity. So you basically have to cover the original one with epsilon over kappa granularity so that you can turn that into a cover, epsilon cover of the new composed function. And this is pretty much just trivial because if you just take, I guess I will just take epsilon over kappa cover for F and then like then, so suppose this is take, let's call it C and then phi composed with C, it, I claim it is epsilon cover of phi composed with F. Um, so because just for every phi composed with F in this class, you can just first take F from F prime in C such that um, this rho f, f prime is less than epsilon. So you first find this cover um, in C and then you just compose it. So phi composed with f prime, I claim that this is actually a near neighbor of phi composed with f. This is because if you look at distance between this two thing, this is um, square root one over n sum of phi of f prime, zi minus phi of f zi. And you use the, the Lipschitzness. So this is less than one over n times kappa square. And then because f prime and f are epsilon over kappa close, so this is kappa times epsilon over kappa, which is epsilon. So, so we are done. Um, yeah, so Okay, I guess that's a, that's a good stopping point. For, um, and we'll continue next, to, uh, next lecture about deep nets. Cool, any questions?
Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So I should. Yes, that's right. The lips is. Yeah. So, so, so far, I have actually a, a one-dimensional function. Phi is a one-dimensional thing. Right? I have, I have output one-dimensional thing, and then you have a one to one r to r function phi. So, so there's no metric, but yes, but if I have output a vector, and then your phi is a vector to vector function, then you have to make the norm everything compatible. The lips is this has to be the same thing compatible with the norm. Yes, yes. So I know we're going to use just L2. Um, okay, okay, sounds good. Okay, I guess I'll see you on Wednesday.